Welcome to the Spirit Led Podcast, your guide on a journey to full enlightenment in this beautiful life. I'm your host, Joan Hope Craig. Each episode, we explore spiritual wisdom, life's purpose, and the profound impact of daily choices on our personal growth and the world. In this episode, we're joined by Marty Wootke, a 40-year pioneer in neurofeedback. Discover the fascinating links between meditation and the brain and how spiritual practice affects our minds. We explored how spiritual growth helps us overcome mental, emotional, and behavioral obstacles, leading to profound transformation in the brain and in our lives. Marty also shared some stories from his early years with Kriya Yoga and his guru, Roy Eugene Davis. Now, beloved divine beings, take a deep breath, let it go, and let's dive into the science of spirituality. So may our session be fruitful, may we work together in harmony, and may each of us and all the listeners gain the clarity and awareness that we need. So feels good to start like that. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we have. I know you have so much to share with us about your own life, your practice, your clinical work, uh, brain science. But what I'd love to hear for, from you first is just how you even got on this path. Like what was going on in your life that you even ended up meditating? Okay. Um, so we have to go back a ways. Uh, I, I'm from New York. I grew up in New York, outside of New, uh, Manhattan on Long Island. And um, unfortunately, I had a, a fairly rocky adolescence, uh, fell in with the wrong crowd. And like so many people back then in the, in the 70s, early 70s, um, I fell into drugs and started to use drugs. And uh, I like to... Um, to uh, say that as young uh carl young said to the founder of alcoholics anonymous bill williams that uh people who use drugs were were basically engaging in a perverted search for enlightenment so i can excuse myself <laughs> and roy liked that quote too so i went it was really bad i went through many uh, uh drug overdoses and many treatments, you know, hospitals and treatment centers. Uh, nothing really uh, was working. And finally, in um, October, actually, it will be the anniversary of this year, 1978. So quite a ways ago, I was 21 years old. I had a spiritual experience, like many people uh, suffering from addiction. And, you know, the... the ex- it, at that point in my life, uh, I didn't really have anywhere to go, so I just surrendered. I had no idea what I was surrendering to, but I did. And then I had I had an, a very profound awakening experience that lasted just a minute or two. But that's it. That turned my life around, and um, it became quite evident. Uh, I couldn't argue with it. You know, I, it just the transformation was clear and. Uh, my life uh, took on a mission role. I knew I had to do something. I knew that I was a alive for a reason. And so, um, you know, I, I decided I wanted some kind of a ministry. So I went back to, to uh, university, uh, even though I'd suffered along the way. And I, uh, I decided I wanted to get into chiropractic. I felt like that was a good pathway for ministry. And um, I so I ended up moving from New York to uh, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, to attend a university there, Life University. And uh, you know, I, I liked it. I, I I felt like it was a good uh, you know a good program. It was holistic, and a lot of my <clears throat> classmates were very spiritually oriented. I had never met people like that uh, up in New York, anyway. And um, just one of my classmates saw my intense spiritual uh, um, attraction. And I I visited his apartment one day 
and sure he had a picture of Yogananda on his um on his mantle place over his fire and I said wow that's an incarnation of divine love <laughs> not knowing what I was saying and he went you know how did you know and he said, I think you need to come meet this guy. Uh, he's doing a lecture at a religious science church over, not to this guy. He wasn't referring to Yogananda, obviously. Uh, he had actually lived in Lake Mon at Center for Spiritual Awareness. So he said, you need to come meet this guy. He's my guru. So I went to the, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. Roy was speaking uh, on North Druid Hills at a religious science church. And um, as soon as I saw him, I knew, I said, wow. You know, it was just, it was this uh, intense recognition, which he had too. He, yeah, he came up, I went up to him afterwards. My friend introduced me and Roy patted me on the back and said, come up and see me. So I started going there, um, you know, and I knew I should back up a little bit too, because this is really was my path into meditation, I knew that what had happened to me was replicable. You know, other people, I'm not unique, other, many people had, and I realized that meditation or the meditative state at least was a key to this spiritual awakening experience. So I, I was uh, I was living in Marietta then, just, just north of Atlanta, and every Sunday I drove up to CSA and um, Sometimes, you know, this was this was a long time ago, uh, early 80s. Sometimes uh, it was just me and Roy meditating in the hall and a uh, profound experience. And of course, I attended the uh, workshops and, and every Kriya initiation that I could make it to. And I did that for a couple of years. And then finally, Roy saw my intensity and he said, too, you know, how's school going? And I was, you know, eh, that's okay. He said, you want to move here and live here and work here and study? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so so I moved there, I guess it was 1982, and um, lived there on the grounds and, uh, you know, did sort of this uh, semi-monastic thing. And, and, you know, Roy, of course, talked about his meditation schedule when he uh, was with Yogananda. So I decided, okay, eight hours a day, no problem. Uh, little did I know, but I, you know, I got a, I got several hours a day in the morning, afternoon, evening, because that's all I did. I mean, I worked there on the grounds, but uh, you know, I had the meditation hall, I had the temple, but I was able to really engage in very deep, strong sadhana, and I was um, really uh, now I I know uh, very privileged to be able to to meet with Roy almost daily. And then to be his uh, chauffeur, I would take him back and forth to the airport when he was traveling, which he did a lot back then. And um, you know, everybody thinks Roy was this nice, quiet yogi, but he would just, <laughs> you know, for two hours. I was like, ah. you know, I would try to remember and write down something. You know, a lot of it was just, uh, you know, um, anecdotal stuff. He, the, the amount of information he had an awesome memory. But he, of course, told me about yoga and and then his all of his, his other work and ministry work. So it was great. So I, I that was lovely, and I did that for a couple of years, and really got into the meditation. Then, wow! Oh, thank you so much, I, Marty. I've heard you speak several times in the past at CSA and and on mm -hmm. interviews, and I never heard all of those details of that story um, yeah. as you told it today. And and I'm delighted. I'm. I'm delighted at the idea of you and Roy riding in the car and <laughs> him talking a lot. Uh, I met him when he was already 74 and he was mm. very quiet. <laughs> he didn't, didn't chit chat <laughs> with me at least. Maybe he did with others, but, um, and, and, and thank you for sharing about what kind of, kind of the, the challenges that really unfolded for, you know, into something that changed your life and, and turned into service. So mm. Amazing. Thank you. And and so I know a little bit about it, but our audience may or may not. How do you end up kind of finding this niche with the brain and neurofeedback? There in, in Clayton, Georgia, which was uh, just seven miles from CSA grounds in Lakemont, 
it was a, a very plush uh, psychiatric slash treatment center. And it was, you know, drug and alcohol, eating disorders, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, not a huge place, maybe 34 beds. And um, uh, I, one, you know, one day I was in town running an errand for Roy, and I decided to stop in there. And I asked Roy, I said, I'd like to go for a tour. So I went and I met the um, psychiatrist. And as I was talking to him, he was very interested in what I was doing, who I was, where I was living. He knew Roy. Uh, I, I asked him, I said, would it be okay if I came in here and volunteered once or twice a week and taught meditation to some of the patients? He said, absolutely. So I started doing that. And then um, the, the patients who were attending the meditation, it wasn't all 34, it was just a small group. They started to have uh, some profound experiences, which they apparently, you know, the, the medical director would do his rounds at night and go to everybody's room and talk to them. Well, they started to tell him that something was happening. So he he uh, asked to meet with me. This was Dr. Richard Turner, who again knew Roy. And he, um, I was eating lunch and he sat down next to me and said, I don't know what you're doing down there. But it sure is helping. Is Roy Eugene Davis your guru? <laughs> I couldn't help but choke with my food. But he had, uh, oddly enough, he had spent time in India. His father was a missionary. So he knew all about the swamis, as he called them. So um, I, I asked Roy, I said, you know, this is an opportunity. They want me to design a program for them and teach meditation from a scientific perspective. And he said, do it. Roy said, that's your ministry. Go do it. So um, I realized after talking to the medical director and the hospital administrator, that you got to remember, this is back in 1983 in rural, well, you know, in Rabin County, Georgia. <laughs> And I, there was nobody else doing this uh, at that point, you know, that came along a little later on. But I realized that I needed to bring scientific validity, credibility, confirmation to the meditation process, that that would be uh, crucial and critical to getting wider acceptance. So I realized, you know, well, what, what happens when you meditate? Well, as Yogananda said in 1920s, changes the brain. Uh, the spine and the brain is the altar of God. And, you know, those were resonating in my uh, ears. So I talked to Roy about it. And he said, you know, there's a biofeedback is a very credible science uh, now being more and more accepted. So I decided that that was, the, and there was a lot of research on meditation in the brain then, mostly from the transcendental meditation people. So I started to pursue that, and Roy <clears throat> sent me up to the Himalayan Institute in Holmesdale, Pennsylvania, that study with Swami Rama and his, and a lot of MDs there. These guys were awesome. And I went to Menninger Institute, studied there. So I, I went to the, you know, the people who were the best, you know, Swami Rama could stop his heartbeat and control his brainwaves and all that. So I decided, you know, I'd go to the best and study. And I gathered a lot of knowledge, and then sure enough, I started um, using it in the hospital with the patients, and and the results were profound. Um, you know, very quickly, everything from uh, you know in, uh, addiction cravings, post traumatic stress disorder, and so on and so on. But my my agenda was always the same. I wanted to help people clear their minds. At, at least approach the meditative state and obviously the ultimate goal was to have a, a spiritual experience or, or greater spiritual awareness so um you know we had the patients for 30 days back then and i would often see them twice a day and then we had a daily meditation with the entire staff and the whole patient community the beautiful auditorium and a couple of other CSA people were working there, too. Uh, one was a nurse. The other was a director of marketing. So it was kind of a nice to have your brothers, uh, you know, kind of in the background. So I did that for, you know, 17 years and and developed a wealth of experience and knowledge. 
I got published very early on. So, um, you know, so I was thrust out into the field as this expert um, and and have always maintained this sort of, uh, you know, primarily spiritual uh, motivation behind everything that I do. Yeah, it was, you know, taking away people's headaches and chronic pain and addictions. But, you know, my my goal was way higher and uh, not higher, but um, deeper, we, I should say, than that. And and I've maintained that to this day, although I, I treat just about everybody and everything. But that's always the, you know, the 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 the, the primary hub in the wheel. So I did that for 17 years and then uh, opened my own office in Atlanta. And then I started going to Europe. And, and at the same time, uh, my son was born and he had a, a brain injury at birth. So I developed an entire program for kids with autism and brain injury, which is thriving in Roswell, Georgia. It's called Jacob's Ladder, named after him. Unbelievable, awesome place. So, um, you know, finally, when I, I realized I had to move and start a uh, this clinic out here, he wasn't thrilled, but he, you know, gave me his blessing. But um, anyway, so so that that brings us up to now. <laughs> wow, so much you shared, and and there's a couple nuggets I want to go back to. So, you know, we've got the the whole experience, and and I think I read in your book too that you, you know you're treating people's symptoms because that's what they're coming in for. So you're giving them what they want and what they came in for, but always you're having this higher vision for them and for everyone. And you had a phrase in your book that I, I saw it at least twice, silently, secretly, sacredly. And that one, when I read it the first time it hit me and the second time it hit me, and I just wanted you to say a little more about what that means to you and how you've done that. Well, that, um, you know, that's sort of the way I, I look at the work that I do. And a lot of that comes from Roy. Also, if you remember a truth teacher who was actually a Kriya Yoga initiate, um, Joel Goldsmith, started The Infinite Way. And I realized early on that um, our relationships with each other, if we want to take them beyond the human level are sacred it's it's just the self communicating with the self god is talking to god and that's sacred uh but it has to be done silently you can't walk around and oh, you know, you can't. i tried that early on and uh didn't work in fact it totally backfired i was uh working on a, a landscaping crew in in uh, marietta as I was attending chiropractic university and I decided to tell everybody, don't you know, you're God. And, uh, and they didn't appreciate that. I so, um, so th this, this relationship, healing relationship, the deepest relationship we have with each other uh, is sacred, but it, it has to be acknowledged uh, silently and secretly um, because it's like a, uh, an investment and and there's so much power in that in that in 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 being conscious of of our relationship silently secretly and sacredly and i've realized over the years um that we get and i always have been doing this for almost four years really good results across the board with people and then there are other practitioners who you know have been doing this too and you know, have this long list of credentials after their names. And uh and the, and I'm often asked, what do you do different? And that's that's it. It's just it's the that. secret sauce. It's exactly. your secret sauce. It's, it's like you can sauce. get the best barbecue over here, but this place has the secret sauce. It's that so makes true. me think of um I think it's Dr. Emoto did the study with the water. Right. Many, many of people are familiar with, you know, that they wrote the word love on the water and it, yeah. it the crystal, the crystals were different and the molecules were different. And so, um, yeah, thank you. I've, I've actually said that in my mind a few times since I read it, like when I'm working, because I'm not in a uh, full-time ministry. And so sometimes I'm like, okay, I can still do the work here. That's right. 
So that really was touching for me. Well, you know, I could feel like I know I already want to have you back on the on the podcast because we haven't even started talking about the brain science yet. And oh I gosh. could listen to your stories all day. So let's get into the brain. And so in the in the 80s, I think there was an ad, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> they would show the egg getting fried. So what is the brain on meditation? Tell us about that for people who maybe haven't looked into it before. Well, it's um it's the key to meditate. It's the key to everything. You know, every you know, pure consciousness from my perspective <clears throat> and the yogic perspective enters the brain through the medulla oblongata. The uh, the uh, the mouth mouth of God is how I've heard Yogananda refer to it. And then it has these trillions and trillions of neurons, brain cells, and intricate networks that it is filtered to. And then as it goes down that filtering and processing process, it becomes us, or it, it goes into delusion, thinking it's us, It's but it's still that pure consciousness. And... There is no doubt that the health of the brain, the function of the brain, uh, and how locked up some of those networks are, is what we face. And when they're locked up, when there are issues, when our identity is tied into some of these pathways that have to do with memory and trauma, well, that's what we call some scars. And that's the whole point of a spiritual development whether it's yoga or buddhism or whatever it doesn't matter the whole point is to learn to move through these things well i realized that we could facilitate that process just like meditation yoga breathing techniques the well we can also you know measure the brain we use the eeg cap i'm pretending i have a cap on here and we can look at you know, 6,000 metrics. That's what we, when we do our initial intake evaluation, we measure 6,000 metrics. And then, excuse me, we compare them to a database of other people that that person's age, and we see how things are functioning. Is it optimal? And this is electrical functioning. It's nothing, no, not mystical science, although it will, the electrical function of the brain is just like water carries information. Well, guess what? This electricity, you know, your brain can light up a 40 watt light bulb with the voltage. So, um, so we started looking at that and that, that is the key. And everyone is unique. You, there's no one size fits all model to anything, including meditation. Um, there, you have to see where a person is starting from and if the teacher is adept enough, they can gently uh, guide the the aspirant in the right direction. But it may not be sitting for an hour, you know, pumping kriyas. Up. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I've worked with you know many many people. One of my projects was with parolees who had been paroled from prison, and we were we were um, our agenda was to lower the recidivism rate because a lot of those guys end up back in prison a year later. Um, but a lot of these guys, you can't just say, okay, sit down, close your eyes and, and do a mantra. They, they'll, they will freak out because as soon as they do, all of their guilt and shame and all that stuff comes up. So we have to, you know, we have to start them out with things like karma yoga working outside, working on selflessness and so on. So these are all the little dynamics that that um, I've, I've grown to understand and learn how to apply. Um, but the brain, you know, awakening and spiritual development is doesn't happen out here somewhere. It happens in here. And, and we're moving, as Yukteswar says, we're moving now into the more technological age, moving from electrical cycle to the magnetic. And these things are going to be understood and harnessed by us. Uh, not that we can, you know, um, force awakening, but we can certainly lay the groundwork so that it is uh, more of a possibility, you know, because it's been with many of us, 
our behavioral issues and you know the all you look at the yamas and the yamas the the observances and the restraints um these are some scars that for some of us can be deeply rooted and where are they rooted in the brain not not out in the ether somewhere so we know how to affect that now and it's a, it's a gentle process it's not you know we don't go in there with a sledgehammer um but we we can teach the brain how to change the way it's uh, you know, the way it's processing consciousness. Mm. So much of what you said is interesting to me. I want to go a little bit deeper. So sure. for example, just to talk about if someone maybe doesn't know the word samskar, it's like a repeated pattern, right? It's like a wheel. Right. And we maybe we notice that we always get into the same kind of argument or we always notice that, oh man, I made that same mistake again, even though yeah. I told myself I wasn't going to do it. It could be attachment. Uh, addiction but it could be lesser attachments just less intense right just that are or aversion that we're we're making these unconscious choices in life and then we yeah. make like hindsight then we see it later yeah. so when you say we can change the brain what what happens like what does the person need to do and what happens in the brain well it, again it depends on the person a lot of it has to do with um, the brain region uh, called the limbic system. The limbic system has to do with fight, flight, um, freeze. Uh, these are the these are the instinctive responses to internal or external stressors. So first, those have to be quieted down in order for higher states of awareness, or as Roy used to call them higher brain centers to become activated. Why? Because they're using up a lot of energy and they're blocking things. I mean, everything we, you know, right now we're communicating, but everything we think, everything we say, everything we do, um, our anxieties, our worries, are, they're all pathways in the brain that are, and if they're problematic, somehow they're stuck, uh, they're tied in, to a pathway usually that has to do with the limbic system and so you know what our job is initially as meditators is to learn how to quiet that down because that creates it takes up a lot of energy but it creates a lot of obstacles to you know our growth process and um you know how are these networks created well often from our environment we grow up our parents unfortunately our environment and we start to you know there's a part of the, the brain networks called the default mode and the default mode is the automatic mechanism that we, so we don't have to think about driving our car or brushing our teeth it's just in there but the problem is the default mode you know kind of keeps us in this hypnotized state and i don't like that person i don't like that religion i don't like this i have this reaction pattern um so the default mode wants to kind of take over and drive us down the road even if if there's a cliff on the other end so in many cases we have to we have to take that and quiet it and it's it's proven and research shows the default mode changes in advanced meditators so what does that mean? Well, they're more present. They're not being driven by memory, by old patterns and so on. Wow. So what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, and I think anybody who's tried to meditate even for a few minutes notices the thoughts, 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 they come. And so some of them are not such a big deal. Just go on by some of them we grab onto, right? And so yeah. the process is, learning to train our brains to focus less on the negative not I, Roy always used the expression life enhancing right so not life enhancing thought processes or feelings or or memories as anything like that and then to train it to presence where else are we redirecting it to like I'm, we focus a lot in our our tradition on the third eye but mm -hmm. So we're focusing there, but are there other mm, things to focus on to bring it away from those unhelpful patterns? Um, the third eye is number one, but number two, the crown, you know, where the fontanelle is, that little place that when you were born was uh, not quite um, sealed up. 
you know, and that's <clears throat> you you uh, sent me an email about some questions. You know, the difference between super conscious meditation and mindfulness, for instance, is that is that in super conscious meditation, we are, you know, we are directing our awareness to these higher regions of the brain. But the caveat is, as I said a few minutes ago, you've got to keep the limbic system out of it. Because <clears throat> I think I, I wrote this in my book, higher states of consciousness have a potentially um, a magnifying effect on everything. So they do, they, they're not respective of the flowers and the weeds. They're going to, they're going to give a little boost to everything. So, you know, the weeds in, in this uh, explanation I'm giving here correspond to some of the negative things in our consciousness. And although exposing them to su super conscious energies has this neutralizing effect, so, some sometimes, <clears throat> you know, like I was saying, giving the example with the paroles, sometimes it magnifies things that we're not, you know, you got to weed the garden there a little bit. <laughs> right. And so that karma or focusing on the virtues and compassion is weeding the garden. I, I, I'm a um, kinesthetic learner. So I, I, I need, I sometimes have to take what I hear and, and put it in my body. And so I'm visualizing the light, you know, light of spirit or whatever coming down through these higher brain centers and it's shining the spotlight. And you're saying it's shining the spotlight on the flowers and the weeds and if I'm not ready for it, it can send me for a loop. Um, and I actually, I know people who uh, started yoga and meditation and then were got really scared. Yeah. You know, because they they found <clears throat> things in their in their psyche that were scary. Um, yeah. There's even some negative studies out of UK, I think, that you know, that are sort of warning people that meditation is not bliss and lights and all that. And it, it um, you know, it points out these these various individuals who have had these negative experiences, but they didn't do it right. You know, it's just they, they tried to move along too quickly. You've got to, got to, you've got to build the foundation. And if we look at the Eightfold Path, right, the, the yoga Eightfold Path, the foundation, as you said, the yamas and niyamas, it's really, you know, practicing nonviolence, you know, eating right, taking care of your body. And um, a lot of people, of course, now come into yoga and meditation through Hatha yoga, right? Through the yeah. physical practice, which is yeah. teaching us to be kind to our bodies and be present. So there's, um, yeah, we can't <clears throat> run before we crawl, right? <laughs> exactly. And you can right. look That's at it. all those, those steps, the limbs, they are changing specific regions of the brain. In, in neurodevelopmental work with children, we say, you don't learn to move, you move to learn. Yes. Because uh, yes. you can see brain development happen when a child's crawling, when it's walking, uh, when it's rolling. These are establishing uh, connections that are foundational to higher brain function later on in life. Just same thing with the eight steps in yoga. They are all building on each okay. other to develop uh, very specific regions of the brain. Our conversation is making me think about just simple things we can do. Like, are there in your book you you wrote about many techniques for daily life? Obviously, we know part of part of spiritual growth and part of changing the brain and is sitting to meditate. But there's so many things we can do during the day. Are there little quick habits that you have that you've adapted over time to just kind of snap out snap out of that default mode and get in the moment? and and be be centered and and present yeah i think that i was thinking about that the most useful thing i found and many of my clients have found is this um, notion of the gap between thoughts because the gap between thoughts is from a neurochemical perspective the opportunity to shift but it's subtle and you, you have to be conscious you have to be aware and and um not watch for it but learn how to perceive it and then in those tiny gaps between the thoughts you can change everything you can remind yourself you can, you can remind yourself of this silently secretly sacredly mantra um it, it's it's really a key it's not easy though and it, it does require work 
um, to to pay attention to the gap. But that's that the gap is the opportunity for neuroplasticity, which is a fancy word, but it just means that our brain is not this frozen thing. It is plastic and it can mold itself. Uh, and for things like meditation, I call self-directed neuroplasticity. So self, so meditation is the key, but then the, you know, it's not just about the 20, 30, 40 minutes we sit there to meditate. It's about the rest of the day. What do we take from that meditation and how do we apply? And again, I think the gap is one. And the, you know, the 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 other thing to with the gap is is tying it into breath, because your breath. Uh, the cycle of breathing is intimately connected with the mind and the body and the emotions. So why every meditation uh, tradition, almost every, um, has some kind of uh, breath awareness or breath technique. So that, that, I would say, is the other key. Learn how to monitor and regulate your breathing. When I went and studied with uh, Swami Ram at the Himalayan Institute, we spent four days on breathing. You know, and I was there with a bunch of MDs. We're like, we want to know the secrets. You know, how do we levitate? We don't care about breathing. <laughs> but he, he just, he was a, you know, he and and I, I'm thankful for that now because that was uh, integral to to my work anyway. Right, and so we won't necessarily endorse like one specific breathing technique here because no. everybody's different, their body constitution, and yeah. but we can observe the pause between the breaths. Yes. And that yes. to me is where I find that gap that you're mentioning. And um, what you said also made me think about Viktor Frankl, um, who wrote I think, The Meaning of Life. Is that? Yeah. And, and yeah. he talked about in between the stimulus and the response, we have, there the, you go. We have that's the choice. It. Same, so it's same thing. Yeah. Good teachings that's in lots of different forms. Well, um, yeah, that's, that's where the choice lies. Yep. There's so much more I want to ask you about. And, and maybe we'll save some of it for another visit. But one thing, um, that I'm personally going through right now is a transition with mm, social connections. And the more I meditate and, and follow our teachings, I, I tend to socialize less and, and just, you know, but also so often in, in, in many scientific studies, we see the importance of social connection for the brain's health, just even as we age to like, minimize the chance of Alzheimer's and things like that. I just would love yeah. to hear your perspective on how that plays out in the spiritual path. Well, I think, um, you know, it's relative to, to where we are on the spiritual path. There is a point where solitude and quiet and uh, less distraction, um, socialization, for instance, is, is I think, important. But... Um, once we get there, then social interactions and things like that um, are okay. But if if our attention and energy is beginning to get diluted and distracted, we, we have to pull back. Right. But for the normal, quote-unquote, average individual, like there's a, a series on Netflix called uh, The Blue, Blue Zones. It's about people who live past 100 years old, so Okinawa, Sardinia, Loyola. And socialization is huge as far as one of the factors. Um, and, you know, not to get into morbid things, but right now among uh, young adolescents, the depression, anxiety, suicide rate is an epidemic. And largely, uh, you know, people want to blame all kinds of different things, but there's some uh, information showing the correlation with um social media and social media is not communication you know and covid and then that isolation that occurred during covid right so i again i think that socialization is relative to where we are in our lives and our, our right. development and um some of us you know need it to be healthy and happy uh, others of us it, it's you know we've kind of gone through that and then it, it's it's good for us and I'm just thinking quality over quantity, maybe, yes. you know, because social media is maybe not quality connection. And yeah. and even though a lot of young, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about the young people and maybe we'll talk about them more on a future episode because um, I see that in some of my young friends and family members, some suffering, right? Just yeah. Some, 
some real suffering. So um, let's maybe table that one for a talk going sure. deeper. Maybe we can talk about some solutions and and yeah, we actually just uh, that. are establishing a five hundred one c three nonprofit. Uh, to to treat those kids. Oh well, then we'll just definitely link it in yeah, the, in the notes yeah. here because we'll talk about that more. Well, mm-hmm. I want to move on because um, again, I want to talk to you all day. But in your book, you had some a section called the wake up call, and these were some questions you said that everyone ends up asking themselves. So I want to ask you. <laughs> so the questions from your own book. One of them is, "Who are you?" Huh. Um. Well, you know, from the from the. Uh, truth perspective, pure consciousness, you know, working through a mind and body and um, involved with my mission. But I, I know what is in charge, you know, <laughs> and I'm just kind of playing a role, filling in as best as I can. Um, so I, I, I know, though, and I've realized in uh, certain meditations that you know, I'm, I'm pure consciousness. You're pure kind of all this is just pure consciousness. So. Yeah. Yeah. And and our uh, Roy often said, what are you? Right. That was his question. So who and what, who and what are you? And what yeah. is your, what is your purpose? Um, well, I'm very, very much in allegiance with the Kriya Yoga tradition. Also, and Roy kind of set me up for this offshoot of that mission. It's also to, um, bring science which which is much more acceptable and can tend to reach more people um into the process and that's what i do i mean i mean you know not that i'm a, a this a scientist but i am certainly uh quite an expert on neuroscience in the brain so um and then what happens in meditation how the brain is transformed so i feel like that's my mission yeah and uh, you know when i look back over the last 40 years we'll I can say, well, that's what I've done, and that's what I continue to do. Um, oh, yeah. And it's so important, yeah. What is God? Well, you know, again, from the yoga perspective, there is a transcendental aspect to that, which is beyond everything, pure consciousness. But then as as the expressive qualities uh begin to manifest then you know that's what most people refer to as god this divine presence that in the deepest silence we can feel um but it's you know again it's everything there is nothing that we see feel hear or touch that is not that and you know quantum physicists are beginning to to say that so um and the more we you know, you know, people are, well, what's God consciousness? Well, it's it's just being conscious that everything you see, hear, feel, and do is God. You can't can't not be, you know. So Yeah. So and that's my everything. <laughs> God is everything. Well, there's so much more I want to discuss with you, but we probably need to wrap up for today. And okay. so maybe you could end by telling people about the Infinite Potential Institute and okay. who would benefit from connecting there. And then also just any any parting words for the audience for today. Um, okay, so the Infinite Potential Institute is our latest name. There's been many iterations from Wetke Institute, uh, Wetke Institute of Neurotherapy, um, so Infinite Potential Institute just happens to be our latest iteration. Uh, so what we are is um, an outpatient clinic, although I, I don't like to use the word clinic because we're not medical. Uh, if, if you were to look at biofeedback and neurofeedback, it's really educational. But, you know, I've been doing this for so long. Our clients come from all over the world now. They, you know, this is Santa Barbara, beautiful here so they will come stay for uh weeks um not everybody they, we get local clients from los angeles and santa barbara and ventura some of the local areas but um what we're devoted to is 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 facilitating the healing process whatever that may be i mean we get people coming with uh you know mild cognitive impairment and a traumatic brain injury post-concussion depression, anxiety, but I've got Buddhist lamas coming in too who want to improve their meditation. We have a little bit of everybody and everything. Um, you know, people are going to have different goals, 
but um you know we my expertise is looking at each individual and knowing you know where to sort of gently guide them so to to be there in person you'd wear the cap that you described and yeah you if, wear this eeg cap uh -huh. can it be done remotely can your work be done um, remotely? during covid we did the, the problem is the equipment is very expensive it, it so we would actually attached. send yeah we'd send uh you know the hardware the software and you have to wear the cap when you actually do the feedback training uh we did that and it was okay um but it wasn't anything as near as robust as when you have the person face to face but we did it we had people as far away as hong kong um and, who we, we were doing it remotely with him yeah. so what i'm hearing is that people could come to you and to the potential infinite potential institute for cognitive issues maybe even like memory loss issues with age things like yeah, that. yeah that's a, okay. that's a big one uh, uh, anxiety any kind of thing but also they could come like to fine-tune their meditation practice yes like, let's say i'm like yeah i'm kind of getting stuck here i'm a little stuck i need some yes. more techniques or some more personalization to my routines or things like that that's interesting yeah, yeah that's that's a big part of, of what we do we have you know, we have a nice group of uh, Kriya Yogi meditators who we work with. Yeah, wonderful. And then anything else you'd like to share for today, like message? I feel like we didn't end up talking about the details of the brain as much as I thought we might, but it's okay because we, we went with the flow and um, and we talked about consciousness, which is everything. <laughs> so any parting thoughts that you wanted to communicate today? Um to your audience if you're not meditating learn how and start right away it is probably the you know one of the most important um interventions for keeping the brain healthy the other is exercise movement in fact with the uh, blue zone documentary that was one of the common factors among these 100 year old riding horses and tending their gardens so, so these are, are critical factors. You know, it's, it's hygiene, uh, how, you, how we take care of the brain. Um, and I, I'll pass on something that I remind myself several times a day. Um, Roy used to do a, uh, a very short, uh, just a couple of minute blurb on a local radio station there in Lake Mott. It was called... Um, named after one of his books, Guidelines to Inspired Living. And the last one, he very last one he did has made the biggest impact on me, I, you know, obviously because it was the last one. But every day it goes through my mind at one point or another. Uh, he uh, And I can almost, I can say the beginning verbatim, Hi, this is Roy Eugene Davis with another edition of Guidelines to Inspired Living. And then he gives the choose to be happy. Happiness is your essential nature. And I was like, oh, yeah. So, so uh, that is that is is, is a, a mantra I am really keeping in my consciousness. And then you start reading that, you know, how do you know if you're getting more spiritually advanced? The absence of anxiety and happiness. You know? So this is this is uh, the key to our development. Um so anyway, I think that that if 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 your listeners can remember that one, that's the biggest the biggest gift I can give. Oh, Choose I love it. To be happy. Thank you so much. And 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 what I also love about your teaching and your ministry is you have all this science. You have done the work. You have done the research. You've done the clinical work, and you also have a devotional heart. You know, and and that kindness comes from from within you. So thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely. Your time and your energy and your awareness with us. And um, yeah, we'll we'll hope to see you back on the okay, Spirit-Led podcast. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah, really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for tuning in to the Spirit-Led podcast. Special thanks to our producer, Monty Craig. Please subscribe to catch upcoming episodes. For support in your awakening journey, visit our sponsor, the Center for Spiritual Awareness at csa-davis.org. We offer online group meditations, classes, and in-person retreats at our headquarters in Lakemont, Georgia. 
Once again, that's csa-davis.org. Until next time, remember your pure essence of being an eternal relationship with the infinite.